I no, I knew English, English, but I just didn't speak it the way the way I do now. Like, and, and I still think I like you know have so much more to learn on on how to like have more fluidity. I guess. How are you, brother? I've been good, man. I've been good. That's good. Um, I'm Adam, and it's very nice to meet you. I've actually nice to meet had, you, Adam. Uh, uh, Salem was on with for blood uh blood bather. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm excited to to chat with you. Hell yeah! Amazing, man. Well, um, to start off, this is about you and your journey in music, and we'll talk about uh the the album you have coming out. I think next month, I believe, right? Yeah, February sixteenth. It's very soon now. Coming up, man. Coming up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, first off, where were you born and raised? I was born in Santiago, Chile. And I was raised there until I was like about 13. Then we moved out of the country. Um, and then we moved around and uh, came here with my family, uh, I think in 2014 or 20, 2015. Yeah, sometime around then. Moved to Florida. Is that where you're at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. South Florida. Wow, man. Okay, so born and pretty much raised most of your life in, in Santiago, Chile. What was that like? It was cool. I, I like it. I mean... Um, I definitely miss it a lot, you know, because it's such a different place from like America. But um, um, no, it was good, uh, especially for someone who's like, as I was always like into art and shit like that. It's it's definitely one of the most like artistic places from South America. Mm -hmm. We have very, very vibrant uh, culture with all that type of shit. That's awesome. Did you like? Uh, I mean, what? Were you into music and bands from the United States, like the kind of the style that you're listening to? Oh, yeah, always. I mean, oh, okay, that's crazy. Um, and overall in music since forever, because my dad used to be a manager for, for local bands. Um, and um, so I was always around like hardcore music and like new metal bands or, um, well, at the time they used to call it agro metal. Okay. <laughs> and it was it was a bunch of bands that were like Sepultura and, and like Corn, but like in Spanish, you know, and uh wow so, yeah that's a big scene right and yeah no it's huge the down there, right? yeah um and also 80s metal is huge in south america especially chile like we we can't believe iron maiden bro like it's, it's the <laughs> biggest thing over there that's awesome yeah i remember seeing even like rage against machine seeing videos of them playing south america and it was like the most like evil empire era yes like the most yes. insane especially uh, our neighbors argentina seen. they uh -huh. they have the craziest shows out of really? the entire planet like there's nowhere in the world that is as fucking crazy as argentina for live shows that is the wildest experience ever oh man have you been to shows there then no but i've been told oh. the stories and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i've seen the videos i've seen the proof myself like yeah, it really is that going. crazy like um <laughs> i think also there's like um there's like a compilation on youtube of how many bands saying like yo my favorite place to place to play shows in the world is argentina because <laughs> they have oh crazy really have to look that yeah. up <laughs> so they, i think they do the the soccer thing where they sing along to the riffs oh no way yeah they like chant everything the entire song that's wild man it's really wild um well when did you, i mean dad was a, a band managing bands and he was managing bands in that space like those heavier bands yeah yeah no he always wanted to be a musician but um he didn't grow up with the means to to get instruments so he never had the chance to learn so you know next big thing or next best thing was um uh, was to be a, a manager for his homies band so um i was always around like fucking musicians and i always thought it was so cool how they lived their lives i mean you know as a musician you kind of get to be a lot more laid back on like i get i don't want to say responsibility but like the the way that you take on life it's definitely more i guess i don't know like almost like it's like a different i mean most creatives right i mean if you're in the, a certain artistic space like you don't have to worry about uh getting to a corporate job at 9 a.m yeah right? exactly so yeah. so I, that was like the first thing i was drawn to for sure you know it, with time i started appreciating more and more like the meaning of like art and like the the value of creativity and and how important it is to have like any type of creative out, outlet um but the but at first that was the first thing that that drew me to it you're like these guys just get to go like out every night and rock and then basically you know, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny to think like i i thought of that when i was younger as well i was like oh man like 
if I could just be like Fat Mike from No Facts and like all I have to do is like go out on stage and party and then like yeah. you know sleep all day or whatever you know what I mean and then you're just like oh that guy's like one of the most hard 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 working people like on yes. the planet like you yeah. you just see this like very uh you know on stage version of of yeah. people and it's like oh never mind he's like running and, uh, one of the biggest independent record labels ever and, you know writing <laughs> exactly <million> songs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah especially in his case like those artists that like have not only a band but they also run a, like a business in music it's like dude that's so much work i could i couldn't even imagine yeah it's funny um so always surrounded by music when do you start to play um i think i was six when uh one of my uncles he gifted me a, a guitar i think it was like a shitty yamaha but like I, I played it every day and I try to learn like solos from like YouTube videos. And at first it was a bunch of songs like, like Iron Maiden. <laughs> and, like, okay. And, like, Iron Maiden? I loved Iron Maiden growing up. Oh man. I still um, love them. I think the first one I tried to learn from Iron Maiden was Two Minutes to Midnight. Okay. That's a great one. And yeah. then, um, what was the other one? Fear of the Dark. It was definitely oh, another one, one of the first ones I tried to learn. Um, and then they had such sick riffs. Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. yeah, like dun, 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 Hallowed dun, dun, Be Thy Name. What an epic oh, song. Oh, yes, is. man. <laughs> <laughs> no, they have some of the most epic sounding music ever. And then um obviously Queen uh Guns N' Roses, of course. And so a lot of the shit that I found through Guitar Hero and some of the stuff mm. that my dad put me onto. Okay. Um and then I kind of quit like after a year. I think I, I only really played for like a year and then I quit. And um I didn't get back into it until I was around 14. And so during those, uh, I mean, you said six or something you're playing. Yeah. Games. So yeah, yeah from super. six to like 14, there was like a huge amount of time that I, like I didn't really play or like didn't really practice any instruments. I still yeah. loved music and I kept finding more and more music that I liked. And most importantly, I found like uh post harker music and, and emo music, which was, I would say the thing that affected me the most and like my music journey. Um, and so when I got back to it, I got back into wanting to learn how to do screams and vocals. And I learned how to scream in like a year and a half, I think. And wow. as soon as I got that down, I was like, okay, now I need to start a band. And <laughs> I I remember I tried for a band here in, in south florida in high school and i got kicked out because they were like nah your voice is too girly i was like bro really <laughs> so yeah oh, no, and, and with good reason like i've always had a high-pitched voice and at the time you know i was trying to like imitate singers like fucking big fuentes and like okay uh, sleeping with sirens and all that shit that i was first into so i was like but those guys have high range voices yeah but I don't know. Um, I felt so like I don't know, like uh, tried that I went back to the drawing board and I was like, okay, I need to learn how to scream like for real. And like a couple years down the line, like I I got really good at at, at doing gutturals and like you know screamed vocals. So I started a hardcore band um, that was influenced by that whole like sworn in wave. Mm, so I would okay. say yeah, that was around like twenty fifteen, like the end of twenty fifteen, and then um, that went on for like a year before um i met like the the group that would end up becoming um the requiem and we started doing all that stuff okay um yeah i listened to your it's funny that you said that you had like a high-pitched voice because i listened to <laughs> i only say, think it's funny because like i listened to yeah. the songs that you guys have released and to me it, it doesn't sound that way i mean like when i heard it it's you, you've got a great voice and it had it, it Thanks, sits man. in that like 2000s like emo you know yeah screamo place like i think of like i don't want to offend you but i mean like a, a finch type voice where it's not like su it's not high you know that's sick dude that's exactly yeah. what like we try to go for like finch burn mccracken like all those type of dudes because they, oh. they had that like a little bit of grit to it mm -hmm. and it just sounded just so genuine like you know those, those dudes were not looking for like a pitch perfect type of sound they were just looking for the most i guess full of emotion and like it you know you can actually feel the the right the, the, the lyrics so yeah the how they're singing right mm -hmm. yeah that's how i feel like when i heard your songs because i'm like okay he's you you're obviously on key and you got a cool you know great voice but yeah it has that like kind of like grit to to the vocal and i was like oh this is really cool and it definitely 
for being uh, a twenty twenty four record, it's cool to kind of be like, oh wow, this really would have fit in that time zone. But it's definitely more modern. It, it's it's hard to explain, but it's cool yeah. to see like how the emo, you know, when we were young, fest. I remember seeing those bands when I was in high school, and there'd mm-hmm. be twelve people there, and now they're playing these huge festivals. Um, yeah. But to kind of have a band that's in that same vein, but doing it now is, I, I think it's rad what you guys are doing. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So how do you then, so you get, you move to Florida and that's kind of when you, what, start picking up playing in. It sounded like you're 14 and you moved to South Florida. Yeah, I was, I was just looking for 13. the music scene as soon as I got here. And I think I went to a couple of shows. Uh, I saw like Attila with like Sornin and I saw like, um emir i think was with a couple other bands um it was like emir and siler and some other bands Mm -hmm. and at that show was where i met uh jeff who's like um he used to be in blood bay there too um and um jeff kind of put me on to everyone and like all the shows that were going locally Mm -hmm. with like these flyers he was passing around and I was like, oh, man, I got to show up to these, like, every single one. And I try to show up to as many as I could just to see, like, how the scene was. And I, I just, I feel enamored, like, right away because it was so cool. Um, I think Florida has always had a very, very good local music scene. Mm-hmm. It's, it's never been bad. So um, I was very interested in, like, starting my own band and becoming a part of it. Um, and I think it was around that time where I met uh, Salem. I think I, I saw him at one of the first like Blood Bather shows that that they were that they were playing and um I, think I remember I just saw him wearing a dress and I was like, Okay, <laughs> that person's fucking dope. I need to talk yeah. to them. Like and um I remember funny enough, they were playing like emo music on the on the speakers too. So I was like I was like, um, yeah, you like this type of music? He's like, Yeah, I fucking love this. Yeah, I was like, It's cool. You know, I, I barely spoke English at the time, but I was just like trying to make friends with everyone that i thought were cool and he was definitely the one that stood out the most like super cool and um since then you know i i, I came across felipe who plays guitars in, in in the band and um he's also chilean um oh awesome so we clicked on that immediately and we both like loved the same amount of like early 2000s and even previous like 80s and 90s music um so started working on shit right away after that i mean so you started working with him and then eventually you guys came together and started this yeah band. salem joined later on um and i think that um the reason why was because he, he didn't know for sure if he wanted to join or not but he like had worked on on our music since the first song because he helped us um produce and mix the first song that we released under our previous name and then the second one the third one he was like okay i think i really want to do it. so like, then he just joined the project and um yeah then then it, we started like working on all all the stuff that like like funeral you know and all those awesome. songs yeah 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 because yeah, i talked to him it was like 2000 it was like 2020 so it was like the pandemic in full force like mm-hmm. fall of 2020 and uh, they had that, he had the Blood Bather record finished since like the year prior. And it was like finally going to come out. And um, COVID fucked everything up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was interesting because he was talking about uh, he was in a band that Blood Bather became a band because they wanted to get more money when they were touring because they couldn't afford like to keep going if they weren't making like 100 bucks a night mm-hmm. or 150 a night. So then they created Blood Bather to be like a package of bands, but it was all the same people. Yeah, yeah. So they could, yeah, so they could keep going and basically do two sets, which I thought was hilarious. Uh huh. Um, yeah. And was um, I forgot the 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 guy near not Felipe, uh, not Salem. Um, who's the fourth guy in your band? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Alex. The other guy that was Our in Blood Bather. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So they he was he were they both in that same band that then became Blood Bather? They must have been, right? I think in 2020, Alex might have already like went on. Yeah, I think he went on tour with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah I always thought that was so funny that they would like play um back and forth, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think a, 
a lot of other local scenes can relate to that. Like when you show up to a show and it's like four bands and like there's at least one guy that's like in all the bands. Right, right. Um, <laughs> but they they definitely took that to the next level. <laughs> it's like just the same. Same yeah, I thought that, that was such a creative way to go about it. Um, yeah. And then their band got big and signed to Rise Records and all of that. But it's that's awesome. So you meet up with them. It's interesting that you didn't know English to me because it sounds well, like you I, I knew English, English, but I just didn't speak it the way the way I do now. Like and, and I still think I like, you know, have so much more to learn on, on how to like have more fluidity, I guess. Really? I would have never I guessed. use many crutch words to this day and I, and I don't like that. But um, I definitely like barely spoke anything back then. Like I was, I had a thick ass accent, dude. I was in ESOL class when I first joined high school. You know, I was that okay. second. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only English I knew was from like video games and movies. Um, I've always, I've always been attracted to English. I think I've always thought it's, it's a, it's a language that I, I definitely always wanted to learn it. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember being a JIT and like pausing movies and playing them to read the subtitles and like listen back to what they were saying and try to like learn oh, and copy wow. them yeah um but yeah no i i knew very very basic english as a kid and when i first got here interesting so once you meet everybody uh and you said the requiem was going for a little bit before what salem joins and does that change stuff for you is that like when you signed with fearless like how long were you guys a band before uh, we were a band for like a year before we got contacted by by labels and, and by fearless ultimately because um i think that we were just trying to kind of do it like um without like contacting many people that we already knew from the industry especially salem like we were just trying to you know produce fucking singles and, and put them out and mm -hmm. just see how the reception of like fans would be at first and like if people from our local scene would fuck with it or not. And, and they, and they did, you know, everyone loved us. So we were like, okay, so now we should take it more seriously. And, you know, next time that anyone, you know, approaches us with like, um, any opportunities, we'll, 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 you know, take it more to heart and, and try to see where it goes. And I think it was pretty early on, I think right after the release of, of one of our old singles, Corpse Party, that, um, tuck hit us up and we started talking with him and he just kind of guided us throughout so much stuff um but i feel like we knew from from the moment that salem joined i feel like we knew that like have a good relationship because it was not only one person producing in the band anymore now it was two so mm. it kind of just became so much easier you know i would go to salem to salem's crib and like work on a song and then go to Felipe's house and work on another. So it was just like twice the amount of like uh, proactiveness at that point And like twice the amount of, you know, um, skill. Cause like, um, that is one thing I've always truly valued in other people is the ability to, to produce music on a, on, on a computer or like, mm -hmm. and, and, and to, you know, have a basic idea on how to write music and compose shit. Cause I don't know how to do any of that. <laughs> like I, I only play, <laughs> At the moment, like now, I only play acoustic guitar and 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 I sing and I write lyrics. But other than that, like it's just, I I feel like I've always been the type of uh, musician that like is dependent on 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 the person that knows how to produce to to really put their ideas to to like to reality, I guess. Yeah. So currently, are you starting off songs by like writing on acoustic and then bring it to them? Yeah. Some I just have like an idea for riff. Sometimes uh, some songs I have like the whole song written out, like vocals, melody and guitars and everything. But I just, you know, I need Felipe to spice it up with like actually good chords and not the three shitty chords I know. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, yeah, and then sometimes it's Salem will have a, an idea for for a song. He'll have like the whole instrumental done or like half instrumental done. And then we work on that together. And then, you know, same with Felipe. Sometimes he'll have entire instrumentals. Um so far I, i've been the only one that to work on melodies but um th there's been so many times where they just you know hand me entire instrumentals and they're just like okay put some vocal slips and then, then it's done so That's awesome. you know, it's, it's pretty easy working with the guys and um i think so to that since you know we're only three people like ideas get approved or the like disapproved very early on and then mm -hmm. So it doesn't um, take a long time for someone to be like, okay, I'm not. Yeah, this. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, uh, I'm curious to know, like with 
just because you brought up corpse right or corpse party that one you pulled you guys pulled off of spotify at least i couldn't find yes it. um so label when thing? we first signed that was uh that was one of the first things they asked us was that uh they kind of wanted for us to start from zero and i thought at first mm, i don't know if i would want to do that but the more and more we talked about it the more it started making sense and I ended up, you know, agreeing fully with the idea of starting from zero because it kind of, you know, gives you the opportunity to have a, a full on tabula rasa and just show everyone a full body of work that came out of nowhere rather than like, you know, letting everyone see the progression of how, you know, as much as I love our previous singles, how shitty they sounded to how like good this record is, is, is going to sound now. It's going to be like, I don't know, it would have been a, a very weird contrast for for someone that they didn't know us previously to see. You know, obviously mm -hmm. fans that were already onto our shit would have appreciated that we kept those songs up. But if someone that didn't know us before were to look us up on, on Spotify the first time and, you know, we're a band that signed and we have a full album out and then they just so happen to click on one a course party or, or the old version of Funeral for the first time, it's like, Damn, this sounds like ass. Like, I don't want to hear the rest of it now. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, but it's interesting because that song had so many plays on Spotify, right? Yeah, no, I they, mean, uh, probably Party like and, and Funeral 50... did. They were doing were so good, but um, you would think that they would want the numbers associated with the name, right? If you went yeah. to Requiem and they, the first couple records you saw were hundreds of thousands of plays, you're like, okay, this is legit. Yeah, instead no, of being like, of... we're gonna put out this band, but we want them to just start from zero, which is <laughs> yeah. to to them. That's I mean, to their credit, that's Funer awesome. Funeral that that. uh, was almost at a mill, so we, we were like super happy with those. But but it is ultimately, uh, I think, just it it's just I don't know. It hits better when it's just a a full on like fleshed out body of work rather than you know all the little bits and pieces that led to that place yeah no i agree with i see what you guys are doing or why they went it's just when you have a, a record label a, a fearless records that people in this space know and have known for years right i mean you look at their roster and it's like you know plain white tees and a bunch of other bands that have just gotten massive from from fearless uh and for them to be like, you know what? We're going to pull the two bit, the, the songs that have the most plays and we're just going to start from scratch and we're going to see what's up. I mean, that that's that's a pretty, it's bold, but it's pretty rad that they're doing that. Yeah. They had you guys do that. Yeah. No, and I, I think that the reason why, too, that I, I was so like convinced towards the end to do it was that the whole idea that, that we have for this record was to kind of, you know, be a complete rebranding also from our previous name because we wanted to change the name for a while and uh the reason why we didn't is because we hadn't found a name that like we Work. really clicked with before and when we started working with fearless that was one of the first things that they also mentioned was like okay in the name like do you guys feel like it's to where it's at like well, could we do something better like you know and we were like honestly yes there's so many people that can even tell us our name back to ourselves like <laughs> they, oh, they really? can sometimes look when it you up, say you know? it yeah i mean i don't or i can ask you after yeah i mean uh it was lexquisite delore so oh i i, I remember seeing that band <laughs> name on the stuff yeah, so, okay like, that's interesting people would like see it and like they'd be like oh yeah lexquisite delore but then like when it when it would come time for them to either share the name or, or say it, you know, you'll check out this band, uh, Linguini Delorean. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> it was such a hard name for people to catch on. So, um, everyone just ended up abbreviating as this Lex, and I always hated that because I don't know, it reminded me of Lex Luthor. I didn't like oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, when we came across the Requiem, which was a, a name that I had for a previous project, um, we're like, damn, this, why didn't we think of this like so long ago? Like it fits so much better because a Requiem is a funeral song. So mm -hmm. half of our music is about mortality and like coming to terms with that shit. So it's like it fit perfectly to to call the band, you know, funeral song. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think the aesthetic that we're trying to go for um, with this record and the aesthetic that we're going to continue to go for in the future fits that vibe a lot more. It definitely fits that like theaterish um 
like Victorian, uh, I guess, vaudeville type of look more than anything. Like, yeah. um, I think Lexus de Lore would have would have been a great name as well, but um, in execution, you know, it, it didn't didn't work. It didn't catch on the people yeah. as easily. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I love the artwork you guys have too. Thank it's you. Like the butter, it looks like a butterfly, but it looks like your hand, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's, like it's your, supposed uh, to be like the the bones of a hand inside a butterfly. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really creative. Um, so tell me about the album. Like, um, it's coming out in February. When did you start it? Like, has this been a thing that you guys have been working on for a long time? Yeah, we started the record. Um, I guess towards the end of last year with one single that we knew was going to be like the first song that we went in, in the record. And then I think we went into recording and like the, the writing process of everything else uh, in, in February of last year. Okay. It's been yeah, like February, a year process. February, February 2023, we started uh, working with Steve um, and um, we were at the, fuck, I forgot the name of the studio. Uh, I think it's, it used to be Graphic Nature or still is Graphic Nature in New Jersey in Belleville. And so it was our, it was our first time, at least my first time, um, and, and Felipe's first time being in such a big studio, you know, with like all the instruments he has and all the rooms. And then in the main room, he has like the fucking, I don't know how many tracks, like table, <laughs> with like, you know, the analog. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, I don't know, it was definitely a life changing experience or like a definitely like a huge milestone for for us um and um it went by very slowly um and it was a lot of hard work we almost felt like we went into boot camp and i think it is mainly because of the person we chose to work with which is steve evans um he's such a demanding producer and that's i think the main quality that, that like I loved most about him is just how much I was able to learn to working with him for such a short amount of time. Um, I remember there was some songs that he pushed me to do like, you know, hundreds of takes, like no exaggeration. And um, he kept saying like, no, again, again, again. And like, I wondered like if it was cause I sucked or <laughs> cause like I wasn't, you know, getting to, to what he wanted. He's like, no, you, he was like, you keep trying to do like, you know, hit the fucking, perfect pitch type shit like I, i'm not looking for that i'm looking for like the right take like i don't care whether it sounds good technically i'm looking for something that sounds like fucking real and genuine and, right like, that shit just clicked with me so much because it's you know obviously it could be like a very subjective thing to say but uh when when you're you know giving that much emphasis to each lyric it kind of gives the song you know even more life than it could have already previously had and for me as a singer it kind of almost liberated me to to a point where I stopped caring whether I fucked up or not in some parts. What I wanted to do the most was just to get all that strength out and like the fucking belting and like, you know, if if a lyric was sad, like I want thing and shit. So it's like I I was definitely inspired by by that process and, and I I came out of a, a way better singer than than I ever was before. Cause um in kind of like having that freedom to like allow myself to fuck up. I also learned that I like, I had, you know, even um, different things I could do with my voice that I didn't know before. So it was very fun. Um, and then for the rest of the guys, I'm sure it was the same. I mean, I know for Salem it was cause he, he was, you know, originally um, a guitar player in Blood Bather. And so yeah, for the transition to bass, bass right? for our band, yeah. It was very fucking hard at first. Um, because he was, you know, he could play bass, like it was whatever, but to play bass in the record in front of a producer who's mainly a bassist himself, it was like, you know, he was like, I have to step up. So like, he ended up coming out of the process like a fucking great bassist. And um, same with Felipe, you know, um, he was already like a fucking prodigy of guitar. And now he's just uh, even better, especially with writing. It's a lot faster now. And it's, yeah, I feel like, Going to boot camp is like the the, the biggest thing I could compare it yeah compare it to. And it's cool that you had a producer that was that um you know willing to want to push you instead of just being like yeah okay that take works and then just kind of speeding through the process right to yeah, actually yeah, yeah, invest yeah. and want, know that okay this is these guys could put out a really really good record and I'm gonna help them 
Yeah, yeah. no, it was so cool. The, the, his his approach to music is so fucking raw, and like he kept telling us this other quote. It's like, "I want the fucking blood on the tracks. Like, I want blood on the tracks. Like, you have to leave the blood on the tracks for it to really be felt by anyone else that's gonna listen to it." And when someone like him tells you that's like. Okay, he's worked with Suicide Silence and Glassjaw. I think he knows what he's talking about. Like right, right. those <laughs> records are some of like the most fucking real sounding <laughs> records. So it's like yeah, no, I think that um yeah, it was it was it was such a good experience for us to to work with him and and, and the whole record writing process. It was it was great. That's awesome. And are you guys I, I mean, just based on your website and your Instagram and all those things, uh you don't have any shows booked. Have you been playing at all out or is this kind nope. of something you want to launch as no, like we have the record and we're going to play in this yes yeah, sir yeah we want to kind of come out as soon as we drop the record with like uh at least three shows locally and then a tour right after wow um, okay. but we've been waiting because we needed to get the live the kind of rig going and then also the live setup that we want to go for so uh, we got the click tracks done and, and the the rig. That was the first thing we did, I think, towards like September, October. That's when we were doing that. And then right after that, we started working on like how we wanted to present ourselves and how we want the shows to be set up. Because like I mentioned earlier, like we want to go for that vaudeville look and to make it feel more like theater than anything, uh, just to make it just entertaining. Um and and cool to see live because i feel like when you, when you go to a show you don't really go to listen to the music you go to see the music you know and mm -hmm. um so it's like there's got to be a lot more visual things going on and i feel like for a small band like us it's it's very essential to try it you know because obviously most bands that are small like us would just say nah you know we don't want to spend the money on on fucking getting props and shit because it's yeah we just want to come out there much. and play our songs or whatever yeah right? uh but i feel like when you do take that you know extra step to to make that look really cool and and to make it look like an ambiance and, and like a whole vibe it's it's very rewarding because people will remember your show after they'll be like oh that's the band that does that type of thing you know and it's like their brand almost and i feel like um the bands that have done it historically you know have always benefited from it like i, I know the earliest example I could think of was like fucking Motley Crue. Like they used to have fire when they were playing like in front of oh, yeah. people. So it's like um where there's a will, there's a way. And you know, if you do something really cool, people will remember it for sure. Love it. Love it. Yeah, because there's bands you'll see where they'll come out and just play and flawlessly. Yeah. But not do anything really that entertaining and it'll sound exactly like the record. And you're like, okay, well, exactly. I just listen to this in my yeah. car. Um, and, and, it, and it's the same with like how some bands like even down to the way they dress i feel like the more and more that we are moving forward into like where the genre is going the more and more boring bands are looking to a certain extent some bands you know some of the outcasts they they're going for more of that like goth look and it looks sick as fuck and it's like damn i wish everyone was trying to do something entertaining like that but <laughs> the majority of the bands are just going for the short sleeve black shirt with like the tight jeans and it's like Bro, it's been 14 years. Like, find a different fit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, well, I appreciate your time today, Damien. Thank you so much, man, for doing this. Likewise, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I have one more quick question for you before okay. I, I let you go. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh man, I don't think I have any yet. Like, <laughs> we've well, like learned aspiring man. artists myself. <laughs> yeah. it, it would be like telling someone, "Yo, press R two and X in like a video game," you know, like. <laughs> I don't know much than anyone else. Like, I guess. Um, what was the biggest lesson you learned putting that album together? I mean, um, maybe something like that. Like, did okay, you... yeah. I think the the most key thing, or the, the one that stuck to me the most that I've learned in in, in the record, was like progress was definitely like what um what I was saying earlier about like um to not be scared of fucking up and, and to not be scared of of pushing you know as whether it's your voice or an instrument to like you know as hard as you can go because that's the only way that you're gonna like learn you know how far you can take it and and, and learn more about yourself and, and your own skill in that instrument or or voice Bring me the best world.